In an ideal world, we would all feel comfortable telling our DMs what we like about their games and what we think could be improved, and they would feel just as comfortable telling players the same thing. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a world full of messy, complicated humans with flawed communication styles and fears and biases and uncertainties, so a lot of us are afraid to be honest. And for DMs, that can leave us wondering what we should be working on in order to improve. Now, I can't make your players give you feedback on your game, but I can do the next best thing. So here, I got you something. Surprise! It's general data. I asked D&D &D players on Twitter to name one thing they wished their DM did. Over 750 people replied, and once I filtered out all the forever DMs replying exist, lol, sorry guys, I started noticing some recurring themes. So without further ado, here are the top nine things that D&D &D players wish their DMs did. First up, number nine, create themes. Multiple people mentioned that they wished their DM would help the group unite over something. For example, orchestrating a reason that the group is together, like that they're a circus troupe, or a band of assassins, or an after-school club at the Magic Academy. Or providing a theme for the campaign before character creation, so that everyone knows if they're trying to fit their character into a pirate adventure theme, or an epic high fantasy theme, or a dark horror theme. Some players even mentioned that they wished they had any grasp of an overall plot arc for the campaign, that they felt like even after many sessions of play, they weren't sure what the group was even working towards or motivated by. Now, it's possible for players to do some of these things on their own, but especially if the party members don't already know each other, it can be really helpful for the DM to guide that sort of theming. It makes everyone feel anchored in the story together, and it can also help players avoid creating a character that ends up feeling out of place or irrelevant to the group or the eventual direction of the campaign. If you want to bring this into your own game but aren't sure how, the group patrons feature in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is a great resource. I know some DMs are afraid that providing information like this could come off as railroading, and I get it, but it's a line that you need to try and walk, because if you give players nothing, play can feel really directionless, and there's no reason that you can't work out those themes with your players before the campaign starts. As the DM, you are in the best position to provide a little structure, so players can feel more confident being creative on top of that foundation, knowing what sort of story you're all telling together. For number eight, something I saw come up a lot was players asking that their DM play with them, not against them. Players asked for collaboration, for DMs who would let them succeed and feel cool sometimes, and even for DMs who would just stop narrating long enough to let their party get a word in edgewise. Now, I want to say as a DM, I understand falling into the monologuing trap. I mentioned in my last video that moments of silence at the table can make me afraid that I'm boring my players, but that silence is important to make sure that everyone feels like there's room for them to speak. Even though the DM is guiding the narrative, D&D is a collaborative storytelling game. That means players need to be able to contribute too. And if you as a DM feel like your players aren't doing that, I think it's important to ask yourself if you're letting them. Are you creating space for them to participate in telling that story? As for letting players feel cool, obviously failure is a key part of D&D because there's no stakes if there's no failure. But at the same time, failure isn't fun if there's no success either. You need both sides of that coin. I actually have a whole video about how important it is to give your players the chance to succeed. I'll put it in the cards so that you can check it out. There was lots of specific feedback on combat, but I think it can be pretty well synthesized into number seven, make combat matter. Players wanted their combat encounters to threaten them sometimes, to demand strategy and critical thinking, to mean something in the larger world and tie in with the plot. They wanted maps and terrain to have a purpose beyond just providing a grid to calculate distances. In short, they want combat to be a part of the story. To be clear, I understand that this is hard. Combat already demands a lot of labor just to make sure it's mechanically balanced. But when a single encounter can take an hour or more to complete, I think it's reasonable to center combat as an important area for improvement. It's a huge part of D&D, and it can very easily get boring and tedious when it doesn't feel like it has a larger purpose in the campaign, or when each encounter feels exactly like the last. When I was stressing over this exact problem, feeling like I was boring my players in combat, I did a ton of research and made a video about all the stuff I learned. So if this sounds like an area that you want to work on, check out the video in the cards for a deep dive on some solutions. <laughs> oh god, not again. Come on, it's been over a year since the Penny Dragon Games Kickstarter for Isendor's Vault of Tragic Treasure. Get a hold of yourself! I know, but the pledge manager is closing! Deep breaths. Can you stop crying long enough to tell me what's going on? 
Once the pledge manager closes, print copies will be limited. The thought of missing out on the book is almost as tragic as the book itself. And it's so tragic! Hey, keep it together. <laughs> Sorry, the book has over 300 5th edition compatible magic items with tragic twists, plus lore, encounter ideas, and even three short adventures. Adventures? That sounds happy. I don't know about happy. The Order of Elemental Chaos Adventure pits players against new and classic monsters in the elemental planes. They end up facing an elemental titan. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it does. Thanks. This made me feel a lot better. Wait, are you crying? It's such an incredible book and people are running out of time to pre-order using the pledge manager. We've got to put the link in the description for them. Oh, it's okay. Let it out. Okay, don't kill me, but I have to say it because it came up a lot. Number six is to maintain a schedule. What I heard over and over in these responses is just that people want to play D&D. They want the game to be a priority in everyone's lives. They want to actually play at their sessions instead of spending an hour chatting at the beginning. And they want there to be a plan for what happens if one person can't make it. Now, trust me, I know that long stretches between sessions and last minute cancellations are often not a DM specific problem. You can't control your player's schedules but the DM does have some measure of authority that players don't have. You get to set a precedent for when the game does and doesn't go forward. You can decide that if just one player is missing, you'll still run the session. You can either be the one who communicates about scheduling and sets firm dates, or you can assign that task to someone else. And you can certainly be the one to get everyone's attention after 10 minutes of catching up and move the group towards rolling dice. Even if a player wants a more solid, reliable schedule, they may not feel like they're allowed to express that or take control over scheduling related tasks. In this way, the DM really is in a unique position of power. If your players want a loosey-goosey, low-pressure, we-start-when-we-start kind of game, that's fine. But make sure that they actually want that, and that they're not just tolerating that because they think there's no other option. Number five is to use inspiration. I was actually surprised that this one came up as often as it did from a player perspective. I recommend inspiration a lot because I think it's a really useful tool for DMs. It gives you an easy way to guide players towards behaviors and habits that benefit the game and it can raise the stakes and the potential in key story moments. So hearing that players also want DMs to use inspiration is just confirmation that this is an underutilized, valuable feature of the game. The most common criticisms I hear for inspiration are that DMs forget to award it and players either forget or refuse to use it. But honestly, I think it's just a matter of habit. There are tons of things you can do to combat those common complaints, from using physical tokens like coins to help players remember that they have inspiration, to just verbally remind finding them during important moments. If you aren't currently using inspiration to its fullest potential in your game and you're willing to be convinced, check out my video in the cards all about how to use this tool to improve your games. Number four is to use safety tools. This can mean different things at different tables, but it basically just means having systems in place to make it easy for both the players and the DM to set boundaries and indicate when something happening in the game makes them feel uncomfortable. When there's talk about safety tools in online D&D communities, a lot of people say, I don't use those because me and my players are close friends, and they'll tell me if they have a problem. But judging by how often this came up in response to this thread, some of you are assuming that your players don't need safety tools, and you're assuming incorrectly. Players said they wanted their DMs to ask them about their boundaries before the game starts, and to check in after intense scenes to make sure that everybody's doing okay. Multiple people said topics they were uncomfortable with or hurt by came up at the table, and they didn't know how to ask their DM to redirect once it was already happening. This kind of experience has made some people no longer feel safe at their tables. One of my guiding principles for life is that if it's easy to avoid potential harm, I would rather do it unnecessarily than risk hurting somebody. This seems like a clear-cut case for that. There are tons of easy, free safety tools out there. I'll link to a great collection of resources in the description. If the worst case scenario is that you introduce these tools and don't end up needing them, that's deeply preferable to accidentally making your players feel hurt or unsafe. Number three is a little hard to articulate because there were comments on both sides of this issue. On the one hand, lots of people mentioned that they wished their DMs would give them a clear direction, provide hints when they're stuck. 
People described games where the party was aimless for session after session because they had missed a clue that the DM thought was obvious, or just didn't know how to interpret the information that they'd been given. An open world with no indicators of importance can be overwhelming. But on the other hand, there were also plenty of people asking their DMs to not railroad them into a path, to let them work stuff out on their own, to give them space for trial and error. Clearly, this is a tough needle to thread. What I'm gonna take away from this is that more DMs need to work on how to effectively lay breadcrumbs for their party. It's possible to skew too far in either direction, giving players too much guidance, leaving them feeling like they're not making their own decisions, and giving players not enough guidance, leaving them feeling lost. The most commonly accepted solution for this is known as the rule of three. Basically, if there's something important that your players need to figure out or have access to, make sure there's three ways to get to it. Three methods of entry to the building that they need to get inside. Three clues to the conclusion that they need to reach. That way, if players figure it out from the first clue, then and hooray! But if they don't, there are two more ready-made chances to nudge them in the right direction. This ensures that you don't end up accidentally creating an obstacle that your players, for whatever reason, can't surmount. Number two came up over and over and over in the replies. Players want to roleplay. They want space to interact with their fellow players and enjoy downtime and domestic scenes and holy shit, they really want you to engage with their backstories. I just posted a video last week about how DMs can make space for roleplay at their tables, so you should check that out if that's an area of weakness for you. Some players want to do things like create a homestead or pursue romantic relationships, but you might not know that that's what they want if it's never come up in the game. But most of all, there are so many players out there who are just desperate for their DMs to do something with their backstories. Bring in a character from their past, tie their history to a current plotline, give the party a reason to visit a character's hometown. There are so many things you can do to make your players feel like their character is a meaningful part of your world, instead of just being dropped into an unrelated narrative. Your party members are supposed to be the main characters of the story you're telling, and their backstory is part of that. Reading and learning the history they've created for their characters, whether that's a paragraph or 10 pages, shows your players that you recognize and value their investment in the game. And if there are ways that you don't want your players to create backstory, like maybe you don't want to read 10 pages of their personal history, or maybe you want to place limits on what they can create, you have to communicate that with them. Because given Giving them no guidance and then ignoring whatever they put together makes players feel shitty and unimportant. Not caring about your players' characters is a really quick way to get your players to not care about the game. This is extremely wholesome. The number one response I saw was players who wanted their DMs to be kinder to themselves. Again and again, I saw people saying that they wished that their DM trusted themselves, cut themselves a little slack, forgave themselves for mistakes, had confidence in what they were creating, and got some freaking rest. Players can sense when their DM is nervous, stressed, and too hard on themselves, and it puts pressure on everyone. Not only should we all work towards self-acceptance for personal reasons, but a self-critical DM also affects their party. They might read negative intent into harmless actions out of insecurity. Their players might feel unable to provide critical feedback for fear of hurting their DM's feelings. And DMs might burn themselves out and have to end the game entirely. The biggest lesson to take away from this is that people care deeply deeply about their DMs. They understand how much work and passion goes into what you do, and they appreciate it. Your players have your back, and if they don't, then you deserve players that do because they are clearly out there. Of course, a bunch of people saying this stuff on Twitter doesn't necessarily mean that your players feel the same way. If you're not sure if these points apply to your table, all you can do is ask. Lots of direct contradictions came up in this thread. Some people wanted more combat, some people wanted less. Some people wanted their DMs to trust the rules as written, others wanted their DMs to be more flexible with the rules. I cannot say this enough, every D&D group is different and wants different things. The only way to learn what's best for your table is to talk with them. Open the lines of communication, make sure your players know that you're open to feedback, and receive it as gracefully as you can when they give it to you. If you're wondering what sorts of answers DMs would give to this same question, then you're in luck. I have another video called 10 Things DMs Wish Players Did, and you can check it out right here to see the other side of this coin. By the way, two different people said they wished their DMs would shower, so I think every DM should shower before sessions just in case one of those was your player. Yikes.